5 today. I'm going to read from just one verse, verse number 6. <clears throat> the Lord put this on my heart this morning as I was praying. Sometimes I get a word throughout the week and I kind of know sometimes it's what I think I'm going to preach and it's not what I'm going to preach. So Matthew chapter 5 verse 6, if you got it, say amen. The word of the Lord reads this. This is the Beatitudes, or the beginning of it, where Jesus is Sermon on the Mount. He said this in verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And my, my subject this morning is hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst. Come on, let's pray and ask God to help us this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness. Lord, that you've brought us to your kingdom for such a time as this. I pray, Lord God, at the preaching of your word, that you would save, Lord, that you would heal, that you would set free and deliver. As you have ordained today, Lord, let it be accomplished in and through us. We yield our members to serve righteousness here this morning, that your will can be completed, Lord God, that your glory can be made manifest in this place. We have faith to believe whatever you would do among us, Lord God. And I pray that you would use us to do it today, Lord God. Bless the preaching, Lord God. And take full control over this service. Put the enemy under our feet and give us apostolic dominion, control, and authority. That your will should be accomplished, Lord. And we'll be careful this morning to give you the glory, to give you the honor, and to give you the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Come on and shout amen to the Lord today. Why don't we worship the Lord one more time as we're being seated in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, you can be seated. Hunger and thirst. If you've ever fasted before, you know how strong these feelings can be. Praise God. Some of us run from fast because we are so, so acquainted. Now, you're not supposed to amen that. <laughs> you're supposed to say, oh, me on that one. Thank you, Jesus. Hunger, hunger and thirst. The driving force of humanity, hunger and thirst. If you don't have food and you don't have water, you don't have much in this, in this world. People have fought and died for food and water. There's been famines present that were so, so, so harsh that parents resulted to consuming their children because they hungered and they thirsted. Can you imagine consuming your own offspring because of how hungry you are? Your children start to look like food. That is, that is, that is an insatiable hunger and thirst. Uh, we, we are told a story in the Bible of about of a rich man uh, and a beggar by the name of Lazarus. And, and as this rich man didn't give anything to Lazarus while he was on the earth, he found himself in hell with fire. And, and, and his first request once he could see Lazarus so far off was like, just give me a drop of water on my tongue. He was so thirsty that in hell, his first request wasn't even to get out of hell. It was just to satisfy his thirst. That's how strong hunger and thirst are. Uh, it changes our emotions at times. It changes our actions. When you're hungry, you probably might be a different person. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. All husbands that are married to pregnant women know, praise God, when she's hungry, just, just you know, don't even, don't even try to bring up any, any dispute or nothing. Go ahead and get your baby girl some food. <laughs> praise God, let her eat and get full, and then you can have a conversation. <laughs> Amen. If, if you haven't learned that, thank you. I mean, you're welcome. I just, that was free. I taught you something that's going to save your life. You don't understand. This is life and death I'm talking to you about here today. Don't you, you better not come against uh, somebody that's hungry. Thank you, Jesus. It's, hunger is so powerful that hunger, fulfilling someone's hunger can turn them from your enemy to your friend. Praise God. If, if somebody will feed you something, they're your friend. Pray, I like this person. Why? Because they bought me a burger. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. That's how powerful hunger is. It can change your emotions. People get creative when they're hungry. Amen. Eating ramen noodles with Doritos and pickles in it because that's all you got because you're hungry. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You do lots of strange things when you're hungry. It's a driving force. It drives you to, to, type, to attempt to fulfill it. Uh, people actually work. Hunger is a good motivation to get to work. The Bible says a man that don't work doesn't eat. So if, you know, you see people holding signs on the, on the street corner, I was talking about will work for food because they're hungry. It is a foundational sensation that God put in your body because if you don't eat, you don't live. So really it's an attempt at survival. It's a survival instinct. 
to get food, to get water. If we hunger and thirst, uh, it can change our emotions. It drives our actions. But the question that I have for you today is what are you hunger and thirsting after? Because what your appetite is will determine what your outcome is. Uh, if you're talking about a diet, if you're hunger and thirsting for things that are unhealthy, your body will ultimately be unhealthy. You'll find yourself suffering the consequences of your diet, of your appetite. It won't take effect immediately, but over time you'll find your body start to deteriorate uh, because of the things that you're eating. Amen. And if you have an insatiable hunger, you'll go after it and it will control all your feelings and your emotions right along with it. Amen. You'll start craving things that are not good for you. You'll start desiring things that are not healthy for you and feasting off of this. It turns out that hunger and thirst causes action in your life. And the scripture that we read here presents the, the, uh, the, really the matter at hand. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The interesting thing about hunger is that it's insatiable. You can get full today, but you're going to be empty tomorrow. You can eat a meal in the morning, but you're going to be hungry again in the evening time. You can get as much as you want to drink, and, 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 and you're still going to be thirsty again. Uh, praise God. Many of us, are, some of us have drank alcohol before and been drunk and told ourselves we're never going to do this again, only to find ourselves doing it again. Same thing with drugs. It turns out uh, a lot of the desires of your flesh are indeed insatiable. Your flesh will trick you to convince you that if you get it right now, you'll be full and you'll be content for a while. But that's not the case. It's, it's driving. You can't get enough. You cannot get enough when you're hungry after natural things, after fleshly things. Jesus said, though, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We live in a world that is trying to teach the world to hunger and thirst after things that can never, ever fill them. Hungering and thirst after money, but you can never get enough money. Hungering and thirsting after material things, that you can never get enough stuff. Hungering and thirsting after sexual pleasure, but you can never get enough. Hungering and thirsting maybe after some natural relationship, but that's not able to fill you. But Jesus said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. He said, for they shall be filled. So my question here today really is, what is your appetite after? Do you find yourself running after things that will never fill you? Do you find yourself chasing things that will never satisfy you? Do you find yourself putting things in place of the spot that God reserved for himself to be able to fill and himself only? Because we've got to take an evaluation. Are we spending more effort and time and energy going after things that will never fill us, trying to fulfill flesh that can never be filled? Or are we hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Because if you can get made up in your mind, you can hunger and thirst after righteousness, God is not going to leave you stranded. God is not going to leave you in need. God is not going to leave you desiring anything else. Once you desire him, he's going to fill that desire. See, there's something about knowing the God that you serve and knowing the name of the God that you serve and hungering and thirsting after him where you get a satisfaction. I know who I am and I know whose I am. I know where my end is. So I don't need all the money. I don't need all the cars. I don't need all the houses. I don't need all the material items. I don't even need the best career. I don't even need the best dinner and that all I really need is Jesus and this great salvation all I really need is righteousness and I'm content with that alone because uh, he's the author and the finisher of my faith according to the scripture he is the first and the last he's the alpha and omega the beginning and the end he said beside me there is no God and I do not know another so once you get Jesus Amen. praise God that's all you need praise God thank you Jesus I've got the Lord and I am filled up huh. I don't desire the things of the world because I've got righteousness that has filled me up. I don't desire the sin that I used to desire because I'm full of Jesus already. You'll find this scripture all the time in the New Testament, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Even after they had been baptized in the Holy Ghost, they kept themselves full of the Holy Ghost, so there was no room for anything else. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And We need to be people that walk full of the Holy Ghost. Full of righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. Full of the holiness that God has ordained for us to walk in. 
full of peace full the bible says joy unspeakable and full of glory full of patience full of love full all the way up not of the things of this world but of the things of god i do hunger and thirst after righteousness and living this life for God will put you in positions where your hunger and thirst begins to be compromised. You'll find yourself hungering and thirsting after entertainment, but that doesn't fill you. You'll find yourself hungering and thirsting after fleshly things, but that doesn't keep you full. You find yourself hungering and thirsting after the things of this world, but only to find that none of it can meet any actual internal satisfaction. It can only temporarily fill you up. In the same way that a steak will only fill you up for half of a day, you'll be temporarily full of the things of the world, but at the end of the day, you'll find yourself needing something, wanting something, desiring something. And I, I thank God that I know the thing that is able to meet my desire and fill me up because there's lots of people in this world that are still searching for that thing have all the money and yet have no satisfaction have all of the fame and power but yet have no peace at night praise God have all the material wealth that this world has to offer but have not found the satisfaction to their soul but Jesus said blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness why is it that nobody wants to live righteous anymore why is it that the world doesn't desire righteousness anymore? It's even crept into the church where the church doesn't see righteousness as something to be valued. We try to get away with desiring the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life only to find out that we've been sold a bill of lies. It won't get you anywhere. I'm telling you this morning, you need to change your appetite. What is it that you do hunger and thirst? Look at, let's look at 1 John chapter 2. Verse number 15. Can you turn there with me? When you got it, say amen. Please wait. I'm waiting on you. First John chapter 2, verse 15. Here's what the apostle John says. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. John makes a bold declaration. He tells you, don't you put your love on the world. Who? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Neither the things that are in the world. He said, if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I have news for you, church. You can't love the world and love God at the same time. You cannot love the things of this world and God at the same time. You can't love the entertainment of this world and God at the same time. You can't love the ideas of this world and God at the same time. You can't love the fashion of this world and God at the same time. You can't love, oh, you can't love the music of this world and God at the same time. You've got to make a, this is where Christians struggle the most because we, we're still in the middle. Our love is divided because <laughs> we tell the truth. We actually love some stuff that's in the world. Oh, I love some entertainers. We even made them idols, called them American idols. I love that. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Let me be honest this morning and admit we got some stuff we got to get rid of. We have to divorce ourselves from some of the things of this world. We have to divorce ourselves from some of the stuff that's pulling at us because God wants that love and he wants it undivided. He wants it all. He doesn't want you loving anything else or worshiping anything else, especially not the world because if you love the world, John said, the love of the Father is not in him. We've got to make a choice today. We've got to understand that I don't love this world nor any ideals nor methods of the world. As a church, we can't take our cue from the world. We can't take our ideas from the world. We cannot take our instructions from the world. We've got to stay true to the word of God and let God lead and guide us. We're supposed to be separate church, not in the world. I got a few people, but they're all still waiting for me to hoop and holler. I'm not hooping and hollering at you today. I'm coming with the word of God. I'm telling you there needs to be a separation church the ecclesia the called out ones i don't need to look like you i don't need to talk like the world i don't need to act like the world there should be a marked difference when you see a child of god you should be able to recognize and say they love god they dress different. They talk different. They walk different. Uh, they don't do this. They don't say this. They don't go here. They don't do Yes, we keep ourselves holy and separated uh, apart from the world because we want to love God. And we realize uh, we cannot have our cake and eat it too. 
Oh, thank you, Jesus. He said, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, for all that is in the world. Everybody say all. All that's in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He said, it is not of the Father, but is of the world. We got to recognize that this world has nothing good in it. I know the devil wants to tempt you to backslide and go have a good time in the world, but I've come to tell you the same lesson that the prodigal son found out. There is nothing good in the world, and it will leave you upside down in a pig's Pinna. Don't you leave the church trying to pursue after this world. Don't you leave the church pursuing after its riches. Don't you leave the church pursuing after its relationships. Don't you leave the church pursuing after anything the world has to offer you because it's not of God. It is of the world. And John said the world is going to pass away and the lust thereof. God. Yeah, it might be cool right now. Yeah, it might feel good for a moment. Yes, there might be some temporary satisfaction, but it's going to leave you hungry and thirsty for something that is not temporary, but that is eternal. Ooh, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that means what your flesh conjures up. Oh, glory to God. Your flesh just likes some stuff. Let me give you honest. Your flesh likes some stuff. It's okay. It doesn't mean you're a devil walking in clothes. It just means you got flesh. I got flesh. You got flesh. And there's stuff that it likes that will send us to hell. Glory to God. It is. Your flesh wants to fornicate. You can't let it though. Oh, Jesus. Your flesh wants to lie. You can't let it though. Your flesh wants to steal. You can't let it though. Because if you let it, if you love it, it will send you to hell and you'll pass away and burn up with the world that's going to burn up. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, you're going to see stuff. I want that. And man, we're in that society. Ooh, it's, a, it's a marketing advertising society. YouTubers have made their whole business off of advertising. They show you stuff you don't need every day, all day, all the time. <laughs> I want to get off YouTube just because I don't want to see no more ads. Glory to God. And they search, they know your whole history. If you Google a Nike shoe, I guarantee you, you go on Facebook, you're going to see an advertisement for a Nike shoe. Glory to God. They sharing information. AI hey, got you figured out better than your spouse does. And, and it's trying to sell you everything that you know you don't need. Because uh, you saw it. I got to have that. Uh, I like how that looks. Uh, I like what that can do for me. Uh, I want the pleasure of this. Uh, I want the temporary satisfaction. All because of the lust of the eyes. Uh, it turns out you actually don't know what you want somebody gotta show you what you want oh, lust of the flesh lust of the eyes and the pride of life I had to look this one up it's really the preservation of life it's like the boastfulness of this life that you have oh glory to God like people would rather cling on to this life and make themselves God thinking themselves are so wise it's so smart. I've got all this wisdom figured out for myself. John said the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. It's not godly, but it is of the world. That means by definition, it's going to be unpopular to serve and live for God. I'll say it again. It's going to be unpopular. You're, you're gonna, people are going to ask you about how you live, and they're going to be like, you don't, do, you don't do what? You don't go to the movies? No. That's all I hear. I'm not going to let heathens convict me for my convictions living for God. Let somebody, let somebody that's going to bust hell wide open convict me because I got some standards and rules in my life. You don't dress your children up for Halloween? No, I don't do that foolishness. I'm supposed to be casting witches out. I'm not going to entertain them. Oh. You hear this latest song, won a Grammy? I have no idea what you're talking about because that is of the world. And I choose not to give my affection to things of the world. There's no way I should know more football statistics than I know Bible. Shouldn't happen. That's a testimony of who you love. Glory to God. Glory. You're not watching the game? No, I'm in church uh, worshiping and serving the God that saved my soul. Yeah, my flesh is not happy about it, uh, but I'm not looking for a temporary satisfaction. Uh, I want something that can fill me eternally. 
And this presents the fight that we're in because the enemy is trying to get you to hunger and thirst after things of the flesh. He's been doing it since the beginning. Genesis 3, verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman. Now the woman in the Bible is a, is, is a type of the body of Christ. She, she's like the church. Adam was made after the image of God. The woman was made really after the image of the church because she was taken out of Adam. It's his body, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. So you understand who the enemy is coming after. He's coming after you, church. Hmm. Okay, so we've come to the woman. He said, uh, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And look what this old lion serpent said. Verse number four, and the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And look at this. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It looked good for food to satisfy her flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes as she saw it. And she knew that there was wisdom. I want some wisdom. See what that enemy did right there? He tempted her to go off away from the word of God, to, to not love God, but to desire the thing that would make her like God. Mm -hmm. He's been doing the same thing ever since. And she took that fruit and her eyes were open and she gave it to her husband and he ate it with her. Eve was in a paradise. She had communion with God. She had everlasting life. They could eat from the tree of life whenever they wanted to. But when that serpent came, he took her focus away from all the blessings that she had. All the authority that she had. All of the paradise she was able to experience. And he put her mind upon the one thing that she could not partake of. That's what the enemy does. Say nothing about your salvation. You forget about all God's blessings. You forget about all the time God has healed you. You forget about all the times God has provided for you. You forget how he took you off of addiction. You forget how he took you out of this world. And that devil will get you focusing on the one few things that you cannot have. Because he's trying to get you to be your own God. We are not our own God. But we serve and worship the one and true God. Suddenly, she wasn't paying attention before that. Now she's paying attention. Uh, she wasn't even checking for that tree before that. But now she said, ooh, that looked good. I'm hungry. Huh? And it looked good for food. Huh? And no, on top of that, there's wisdom behind that. Huh? And so she violated the word of God, huh? violated the love of God, huh? and took it out of that fruit. Huh? And the enemy is doing the same thing for us here today. Huh? He doesn't want you worship and serving God. He doesn't want you hungering and thirsting after righteousness. He doesn't want you opening your Bible. He doesn't want you hearing the word of God, getting faith. He doesn't want you praying. He doesn't want you worshiping. He doesn't want you full up of righteousness. He wants to keep you bound in the trap, the insatiable trap of hungering and thirsting after things of this world. But you've got to turn him down every time and say, no, Amen. not doing it. I'm putting my hunger and thirst in God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Your appetite then will determine your behavior. What you're hungry for will determine. You can say that you, you know, if I said I loved Chick-fil-A, but I never went to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> After a while, you start to question my testimony that I love Chick-fil-A. And really, you don't even have to have testimony of those that love Chick-fil-A. You get to look at their bank statement and see all the Chick-fil-A purchases. Same thing with Starbucks. If you love it, you're going to go get it, aren't you? Amen. I can tell what you hunger and thirst after. I just look in your cabinets at home. There's a lot of chicken in this fridge. <laughs> you must like chicken. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. There's a lot of, in our house, there's a lot of LaCroix. We've, we've gotten away from juice and sodas and stuff. We do LaCroix nowadays. So you go to our house, there's a lot of that LaCroix. Thank you, Jesus. It's supposed to be healthier for me. And not showing the evidence just yet, but just you hold on a little bit. <laughs> Praise God. In, that, in other words, I can look at what you do and determine what you love. I can look at what you spend your time consuming, and I can determine what you love. You might testify something different 
But it's the fruit that's going to tell the truth. Because your appetite is going to drive your behavior. Look at this story in Genesis 25. This is about Esau and Jacob. Genesis 25, verse 29. The Bible says, and Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field. And what you have to know about these two boys, Esau was a hunter. Uh, Jacob was a mama's boy. He was a tent dweller. He stayed in the tent. I call him a mama's boy. That's not biblical. That's just the B. Crow version. Praise God. He was in, he was in the house. He was in the tent all the time with his mother. And, and it was a struggle between these two in the womb. It was a struggle because Jacob was to inherit uh, the blessing. So God favored Jacob before they were even born. Uh, you know, Esau is named Esau because he's red and hairy. Jacob is named Jacob because he came out on the heel of his brother trying to hold him back. You know, they, that's, how, that's how much they were fighting. And that's how intense this fight is between the temporal and the eternal, between the fleshly and the spiritual, between the carnal and the godly. It's a fight even from its conception. That's what's really represent, represented here. So now remember, the firstborn gets the birthright. So that's technically Esau. So here it is. Jacob's making some soup. Esau came in from the field, and he was faint. Verse 30, and Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. That means red, according to the red soup. And Jacob said, sell me this day your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. See, here's what's happening here. This is a battle between flesh and spirit. This is a battle between the temporal and the eternal, and it gives us some good clues. The first clue it tells us is that when you're hungry, you're not in your right mind. Some of y'all have accidentally missed lunch, and you've been cool. But if you fast and miss lunch, by the end of the day, your brain is screaming with pulsing headaches. Your body is weak. You're almost falling down the stairs because you missed one meal. No, I'm telling the truth. You call me up, Pastor, I can't make it. Like, bro, we're only 16 hours in. <laughs> it's the truth. We're like, Esau, I'm getting ready to die. No, you're not getting ready to die. It's just your flesh is dying. And your flesh don't like to die. It wants to be filled. Here's Esau been hunting all day, and he's faint, and he's about at the point where he's about to die. And Jacob, you know, he's a trickster. One preacher called him a used car salesman. <laughs> Jacob's a trickster, and he sees Esau. He takes advantage of the state of his flesh. Because when you're flesh, you know, you're weak. You make irrational choices when you're weak. You know, you're not in his right mind. So he's like, all right, you're going to die? Okay. Sell me your birthright, which is not a fair transaction at all. The birthright, I will have you to remember, is the blessing of Abraham. As many as the numerous sea, uh, uh, stars of the sky, the sand of the sea, will I multiply your descendants. He said, in blessing, I'm going to bless you. In curse, I'm going to curse you. He's going to multiply. I'll multiply the blessing. This is all Abraham got it. He said, I'm going to give this, to you, this land to your seed and to all your inheritance. That was the blessing of the, birth, of the firstborn. That was his birthright. This is an eternal birthright. We are in this church today because of the birthright given over Abraham and his seed. We are, oh, glory to God. We are inheritance of the blessings of Abraham through the seed of Abraham. That is Jesus Christ. It could have been said that Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. That's what's at stake here. We're talking about an eternal blessing. An eternal blessing. And Jacob offered him a bowl of soup. He sold out. His flesh was screaming so hard, Brother John, that he said this idiotic statement that I have said myself. What good is this birthright going to do to me if I die? See, what I found out about the nature of your flesh, it is insatiable. And you don't make rational choices when your flesh is in control. 
Is everybody in here, I will bet, has sinned after you've been baptized in Jesus' name? And sinned after you've received the gift of the Holy Ghost? And sinned after you knew what you was about to do could potentially send you to hell should you die in the midst of said sin? So we look at Esau kind of like, how could he do that? Uh, hello. <laughs> hello. You know good and full well, there's been nights your flesh was screaming so hard. You forgot about heaven. Uh huh. You forgot about eternity. You forgot about a thousand year millennial reign. You forgot about the marriage supper of the Lamb. You forgot about the rapture. You forgot about the horn. It wasn't no moment in the twinkling of an eye, nothing. You weren't even thinking about scripture because your flesh is screaming so hard. It puts everything else out of focus and you fell. You sold it out temporarily. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because your appetite is going to drive your behavior. And it's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. What do you mean? You went and fornicated. What about the what about the harvest? What about what do you mean? You lied again? What about you forgot about all the blessing and all the inheritance? You forgot about the judgment seat of God. You forgot, you forgot, you forgot about all the prayer. You forgot about the mission. You forgot about the kingdom. You forgot about all of that because your flesh is hungry and insatiable. Thank you, Jesus. This, saints, is a battle that every child of God has. Paul said, walk in the spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He said, for the flesh lusteth after the spirit. And the spirit warreth against the flesh. It's the same battle between Esau and Jacob. Which one is going to win out in your life? Which one are you going to allow dictate your drive? Which one are you going to allow to dictate your actions? We got to let Esau go. Let him go. Esau will drive you to the grave. Esau will have you selling out the eternal for some temporary satisfaction of a bowl of soup. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 25, for whosoever will save his flesh shall save his life, excuse me, shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my name's sake shall find it. But what is a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange? Everybody said exchange. There's an exchange happening. The devil would like to present you with an exchange. He did it to Jesus. Bow down and worship me and I'll give you all the glories of this kingdom. He wanted there to be an exchange. But Jesus telling you, choose the eternal. Don't choose the temporary. Choose the eternal. Let your drive and your hunger be fixed up on God because it will be worth it. Not a bowl of soup. And I made up my mind. I'm not selling out my eternal blessing for a temporary satisfaction. And you need to make up your mind. We're not selling out eternal blessings for temporary satisfaction. I'm not selling out my inheritance for temporary satisfaction. I'm not selling out my royalty with God for temporary satisfaction of the flesh. I've got to set my hunger up on him. And if you have a hunger and thirst for God, God can use you despite of your imperfections. That's what made Jacob so powerful. It wasn't that he was perfect. He just desired the right thing. What did he had it all figured out? God was going to have to work on Jacob too. But at least he wanted the right thing. See, if you want the right thing, God can work on you. Amen. Oh, Jesus, I ain't got you yet. Some of y'all act like you don't believe what I'm saying. If you want the right thing, God can work through your, through your habits. God can work past your uh, supplanting nature. Praise God. God can work past your flesh. God can work. Because he, he, he got a label for anything problem that you got. Just, just, just believe me on that one. He got a way to work it out. But our desire has got to be in the right place. And I find that people just don't have a desire for God anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we got to change our appetite. Change our appetite. David wrote this in Psalm 42, verse 1. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. How long has it been since your soul was thirsty for God? We got to get back to a place, sis, where I can't wait to talk to God. I got to work right now, but as soon as I get home, I want to talk to God. Oh, I remember Brother Reggie, having to have, I couldn't wait to open the Bible and get in certain places. 
I get revelations in the middle of the day and I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the road driving looking at scripture. Hungering and thirsting, praise God. But if, you will, if, you, if, you, if, if you're not careful, oh, that world will creep in. Uh -huh. And you won't have an appetite for that manna anymore. Thank you, Jesus. That manna will be boring to you. We've been eating this manna all this time, just like the children in the wilderness. We, we want some quail. I want some meat for this flesh. Oh, help us, God. Not understanding that man lives by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Has church gotten boring to you? Oh, glory to God. Has the word of God gotten boring to you? You tired of eating this word? You tired of the same old meal? Are you tired of water? You want some wine now? Thank you, Jesus. You tired of that living water? What is your appetite after church? We have to desire the eternal and not the temporary. This is my last point. The fleshly is temporary, but godly desire is eternal. Let's look at John chapter 4, verse, verse number 7. This is about the woman at the well. Scripture says, There cometh a woman of Samaria to, want to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest me, ask his drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him, he would have given thee living water. Thank you, Jesus. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou the living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well? Yes. <laughs> and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. See, I found out it doesn't matter how much you fill your life with fleshly things. It never satisfies. Even though you're convinced in doing it that it will satisfy you. It never satisfies. And oftentimes, you end up feeling like Esau after you have indulged in your flesh. You end up despising it. So Esau, after he got done, he said, I don't want nothing to do with that eternal thing. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. If you get lost and backslide and gone into sin, you're not going to want anything to do with spirituality. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. No, I'm telling the truth. Jesus presents an alternative to this woman who is there to draw water, which sustains life. You can go a long time without food, but only, only a little time without water. And you'll find that Jesus says, I'm not here to offer you something that is going to be temporary. Because if you drink this water, you're going to be thirsty again. But he's saying in a metaphorical sense, the water that I'm going to give you is never going to leave you with thirst again. But it's going to be a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Almost like every time you dip that bucket down in this source, you don't ever deplete the source. Kind of like when he broke the fishes in the bread and they just kept breaking the bread. And every time they broke a piece off, it was just another one there. Boom. And it was enough to feed as many hungry souls that were there. That's how God works. If you can set your hunger and your thirst upon him, it will never leave you empty. It will never leave you desiring. But it's going to be a well of water springing up unto everlasting life, which is a spiritual thing. And this is why some people don't desire spiritual things because they are not satisfying to your flesh. Prayer is not satisfying to your flesh. Reading the word of God is not satisfying to your flesh. Jesus said, the word that I speak unto you, they are spirit and life. They're not, not, your flesh profit if nothing, he said. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. 
And so that now it brings the real realization that we can see how you can lose your hunger. Uh, you can lose your desire for things that are eternal because your flesh is in control. Praise God. That means there's not enough money. There's not enough power. There's not enough fame. There's not enough sex. There's not enough drugs. There's not enough clothes. There's not enough houses. There's not enough cars to keep you satisfied. You'll always want more and more and more and more. Solomon said this at the end of Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless. He said it was like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Turns out that there was something on the inside of us that only God can fill. There was a desire that only God can meet. There is something inside of you, a void that you were left with after Adam and Eve sinned that only God can meet. But if we want to fill it, we've got to have a desire for God. We've got to have a desire for God. Last scripture, well, last portion of scripture I'm going to read for you today in John chapter 7, verse 37 says this, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto who? Me and drink. Stop running to the world for your thirst. Stop running to carnal things for your thirst. You may not need a vacation. Maybe you need to pray. You may not need a break. Maybe you need a Bible study. Oh, glory to God. You may not need more money. Maybe you need more God. If you're thirsty. You might be trying to fill it with the wrong things. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and let him drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of that living, the same living water he promised to the woman at the well. That eternal thing that will never run dry. That thing that will always satisfy you when people can't satisfy you. When your children no longer are joyous to you. When your money is failing you. When all the people around you have betrayed you. When your flesh is satisfied and insatiable. Praise God. Oh, Jesus said, come unto me and I'll give you that living water. And it's going to come out of your belly flowing rivers of living water. Church, we need that rivers of living water. We don't need more politics. We need the water. Praise God. We don't need more worldly solutions. We need Jesus. Praise God. We need Jesus. Hallelujah. We need Jesus in our bedrooms. We need Jesus. Jesus on our job. We need Jesus in our car. We need Jesus in the morning. We need Jesus in the afternoon. Jesus in the evening. I need to get lost in a good old fashioned prayer meeting. I need to fast and put this flesh under subjection. I need to get my hunger and my thirst back. My thirst for the word of God. My thirst for the presence of God. My thirst to, oh God, my desire to worship and praise him. My desire to lift up my voice and to give him glory to offer the sacrifices of the fruit of my lips and praise and worship unto God. Uh, glory to God. I need Jesus. Uh, maybe we need to sing that song. I need thee. Uh, oh, how I need thee. Uh, every hour. Every hour. Every hour I need thee. Uh, look on the whole oh, glory. Look at the cabinet of the spiritual cabinet of your lives. What's in your house? What are you really hungering, thirsting after? What do you spend your time consuming? What do you spend your energy doing? Is it God or is it stuff of the world? Is it the Bible or is it the lust of the flesh? Is it prayer or is it the lust of the eyes? Is it the eternal life or is it the pride of life? Church, we've got to make a pivot. We've got to repent be honest with God and say, God, I just don't desire you like I used to. Like a marriage gone sour. The flame has gone out. The fire is not burning anymore. I'm lukewarm. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We got to get our hunger back. I got to get that thirst back. I need that desire back. If you don't want it back, that's on you. And I know what God dealt with me here today. Jesus, God is telling us, what's your appetite for? What do you hunger and thirst after? Jesus said this in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. 
He that believeth on me shall never thirst. We've tried everything else, church. And it's left us empty. It's left us void. It's left us in vain, vanity. Let's come back to Jesus. Come back to, oh, thank you, Jesus. Come back to the Lord. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. God's not going to withhold it from you. He's not going to tease you with it like Jacob teased Esau over that porridge. If you want him, he'll fill you up. If you desire him, he won't leave you. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It's time for us to turn to God. Let him fill us up again. Let's all stand. I'm closing today. What is your appetite after? Is it for God? Is it for righteousness? Or do we desire this flesh? You might say one thing, but what has your life testified? Over the last week, what have you spent your time pursuing? Just take it the last week as judgment. If God were to judge what you love most over the last week, what would the judgment be? Can we say that I, I went after God more than anything else? Oh, thank you, Jesus. If that answer is no, we've got to come to God again and say, Lord, fill me up. Fill me up. Empty God. Fill me up, Jesus. I want more of you, God. Less of me, the song says. More of you. I need less of this flesh. Less of this carnality. And I need more of Jesus. Is anybody with me today? Lift your hands if you're with me today. I need more of Jesus. You got your hand up. Come down to this altar. Let's pray. Say, God, give us more of you. God, give us more of you. God, give us more of you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Give us more of you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you, Lord God, for your mercy and your kindness. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness, oh God. Thank you, Lord God, that you've given us an opportunity here, oh God. And I pray here today a prayer of repentance, Lord. Oh God, that you forgive us. Forgive us of all sin, Lord God, and iniquity, oh God. Oh Lord, for allowing the things of this world to infiltrate our minds, Lord God, and cause us to deviate from the place that you have established for us in you, oh God. Lord, and I pray that you would begin to renew minds this morning, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you begin to put burdens back up on the hearts and minds of your people, oh God. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that your will would be done in our lives, Lord. We lay it down, oh God, and pray, Lord, fill us up again. Fill us up again, oh God. Let that river of living water be springing up as wells inside of us, oh God. Let this flow again, Lord God. Let desires, oh God, be renewed, oh God. Let burdens, Lord God, and a hunger and thirst for your word be renewed today, O God. Let callings and ministries, Lord God, be reactivated, O God. Let your will and your purpose over our lives be reconfirmed today, O God. Lord God, for we have left off, O God, serving you in many ways, Lord, and have gone after things of this world, O God, that cannot save us nor even fill us up, O God. So I pray today, Lord God, that you would shift, O God, our hunger, shift our thirst, Lord God. Help us, O God, to desire you in righteousness, Lord. Help us, O God, to desire you in holiness, O God. Help us, Lord God, to desire you, Lord God, above all else in this world, Lord God. O God, Renew, Lord God, your purpose over our lives here today, Lord God, that your will can be done in us. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Now, if you're serious about it, come on, let's begin to pray.
Come on, how bad? If you're hungry after something, you're not going to stay quiet. If you're thirsty after something, you're going to claw to get to it. You're going to go after it. If you really desire it, go after it this morning. There's nothing standing in between you and God but you. Come on, he's waiting on you. He didn't leave. He didn't go anywhere. He's waiting on you to cry out to him. James said, draw nigh unto the Lord, and he will draw nigh unto you. Draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. Where are you, Adam? Where are you, saint of God? Where is your desperation? Does it need to be an emergency for you to call on the name of God? Do you need to be in trouble for you to call on his name? Come on, why don't you show him how much you want him right now? I cried unto the Lord and he heard. Why don't you show him how much you want him right now? How much do you want him right now? Right now. Jesus, we need you right now, God. Jesus, we want you right now, God. Jesus, we want you right now, God. Oh God, come in and fill us up, Lord God. Oh God, pour out your spirit, Lord. We want to be full of the Holy Ghost, Lord God. Father, we want to hear your voice again, Lord God. Lord, we want to know you again, oh God. Lord, we want to be in your presence, oh God. I say, Lord, we want you, oh God, more than we want this world. Lord, we want you, oh God, more than we want our own flesh. Lord, we want you, oh God, more than we want our life, oh God. Lord, we want you, oh God. Oh God, we want you, oh God. We don't just need you, oh God. We desire you, oh God. We don't just need you, Lord. We desire you, oh God. We don't want to just take advantage of you, oh God. We want a relationship, Lord God. We don't want to just benefit, Lord God. We want to love you, oh God. We want to sacrifice for you, oh God. We want to commit ourselves, Lord God. We want to submit, Lord God. We don't just need you, Lord God. We want we want you, O God. We desire you, O God. Oh God. Oh God. Come on, if my people who will humble themselves will turn from their wicked ways, pray and seek the face of God. Everything that's not like you, God, we're putting it down. Everything that displeases you, God, we're putting it down. Everything, Lord God, that you hate, her, we despise, oh God. Anything that you don't like, Lord God, we get rid of it, oh God. We want you, oh God. We don't want the lust of this world. We don't want the lust of our flesh. We don't want the pride of life. We want you, oh God. We want to do your will, Lord God. We want to do your work, oh God. 
We want to be used by you, oh God. We want you to come and inhabit this dwelling place, Lord God. Come in and commune with us, Lord. Come in and dwell with us, Lord God. Sup with us, Lord God. Come on, how long has it been since you prayed through him? How long has it been since you got lost in a prayer meeting? How long has it been since you forgot about the clock? Since you forgot about the time? Since you put your schedule aside for God? How long has that been that you gave yourself totally and completely unto God with no agenda, with no requests? God, we yield our bodies. baptized in Jesus name we've got water that's ready for you we've got clothes for you to change into you can be baptized today if you haven't received the gift of the Holy Ghost come and let us pray for you and God will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost as I look out over this audience all of you have been born again of the water and spirit we just need to get our hunger back get your hunger back Here's how you do it. Get a sludge hammer or an axe and start removing all kinds of foolishness out of your life. Cut down on your entertainment time. Cut down on the stuff you do for your flesh. <sighs> Cut down on your you time. Give it back over to God. Paul said, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Start filling up your agenda, your life again with spiritual things. Get back to your prayer time. 
get back or level up if you weren't it didn't have it in the first place get back to your devotion your study of the word of God if you're struggling with sin the scripture says submit to God and resist the devil and he'll flee from you so submit to God and the word of God and you'll get victory in Jesus name it's up on you. It's your responsibility to come back to him. He didn't leave. The prodigal had to come back home. The father didn't go anywhere. So you got to make the move. In your day-to-day -day life, I'm getting back to God. I'm waking up. I'm prioritizing. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Because I'm hungry for it. And I'm thirsty for it. And it should drive your action on a day-to-day -day basis. I've got to get back to God. More than I need this entertainment. More than I need my job. More than I need this money. I need God. i got to get him. i got to get him. It's got to drive you. It's got to consume you. It's got to be your first thought in the morning. Your last thought in the evening. Meditate upon the word of God day and night. If you go after him with that type of passion, with that fervency, God will not leave you. He will fill you up. Let's do it in Jesus' name. Not just lip service on a Sunday morning. Let's do it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're getting ready to dismiss. I want to remind you of this service tonight. Come back. I'm going to be talking about end times in Jesus' name. So this is going to be very informative maybe a lot more hopeful than what you heard this morning but we needed this amen let's pray as we dismiss today heavenly father we thank you for your word oh god though it pricks us lord god and your sorrow god leads us to repentance lord and i pray lord god that as we draw nigh unto you you would meet us lord god and draw nigh unto us lord i pray that you put a fresh burden a fresh passion and zeal for your house upon every child of God oh God for you are soon to come Lord God we don't want to be found wanting and God seeking oil when it's too late Lord and I pray that you fill us up even right now God let us leave this place in the power of the Holy Ghost Lord God that your will can be done give us traveling mercies to make it home safely Lord God and help us to return again with praise on our lips and worship on our hearts we love you today and be careful to give you the glory the honor and praise in Jesus' name, somebody shout amen to God. Amen. amen. You're dismissed today. Fear the Lord. Fill me up. Fill